Therefore, you first of all must learn and practice the voice of God. How do you do that? By staying true to scriptures. The more you read the Bible, the more you are used to how God speaks. Therefore, he can now reveal what is his plan for your life. The mandate of God for your life is the purpose of your life. Now, the purpose of God for my life is to go and empower the people to live for Jesus. It's to teach and nurture people to live in their life purposes. All right? How did I know that? I didn't sit down and write the book. God told me that. The creator will have to tell you why he manufactured you. You can't find your purpose in a book. You can only find it with God. Therefore, the first task for a purpose-driven life is to build intimacy with God so that you can hear him when he speaks to you. So that when he now speaks to you, you will now begin to live for a purpose that is higher and that is bigger than you. That is the purpose-driven life. It is not money. The purpose-driven life is not finance. The purpose-driven life is not wealth. It is living to fulfill the mandate of God for your time and for your life. Like I've always maintained, the whole world is like a puzzle. At the game of jigsaw, you are a puzzle. In the jigsaw of God. If you don't fulfill yours, the picture cannot be complete. So the reason there is so much craziness in our world is that certain jigsaws have gone missing. And I hope you will not go missing. Amen. 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 All right, that's it. Uh, I, I have a longer version of that purpose-driven message. It can, yes. can take you for like 20 hours. But let's just do it. The second question was, When is it appropriate to express my anger to my father? That's a very important question. Yes. Very important. You cannot express anger to somebody that is bigger than you. <laughs> even though God is a touch God, even though we have tried to make God very touch and cool, don't forget that he's the creator and the, the creator and the owner of all things. By his breath, you exist. If he stops it, you are gone. God is awesome. Jesus loved us so much. But now he created you. We must understand that reference is godly fear. It doesn't mean you are not afraid of God at all. You can ask the question, when is it all right to express my feelings to God? I say every time and every day. But when is it all right to express your anger to God? Ah, I don't think it is normal. I might be wrong. But you can express because anger is a feeling. But you are supposed to actually have a open relationship with God. Before you get to that moment, why not talk to him? Why not let him know how you feel? And you know the problem is that you, when you talk about God, people say, how do I express my anger to God? He knows your anger. I mean, if I'm in a relationship with you, and then you don't know I'm angry about a situation, that's when I reveal it to you. Right? Yes, sir. So I come to you and say, you are crazy, you know, and I start telling you the things you did that makes me angry. But you don't express anger to somebody who knows all things. The Bible says everything is open and naked before God with whom we have to deal. So he knows it. He knows you're angry. He knows you are sad. Without you crying, he knows. So expressing it is not like it will shock him. Because the way we are speaking is like it will shock him when I express my anger to him. It will shock him because he has seen that anger is already brewing in you. He can see. He told um, who killed his brother? Cain. He told Cain. Without Cain telling anybody. He told him. So, the fact is that God knows what you are going through. And the gist is that it's time to have a relationship with him and start speaking to him. You see, if I am sad, I tell him. Not because he does not know, but so that I can say my mind. <laughs> so, express yourself. Express yourself. But is it alright? You know when you are angry, use negative words. Is it all right to use negative God words for God? The answer is no. It can never be all right. Because you can't go to Buari and say you are crazy. I am angry with you. He will be smiling, but the DSS will take care of you. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Glory to God. Okay, next question. The last question is, what does it mean? Discipleship and becoming like Christ. Let me say this to us. That one of the things that is missing in the Christian faith today is discipleship proper training to become like Christ. It takes true discipleship to actually become like Christ. Uh, because discipleship means to be a follower of somebody. Jesus called his two of disciples and he did not send them out. He called them so that they can be with him. Being with him made them to be like him. Because eventually they stood, I believe, in Acts chapter 4. And then they, they stood before the Sanhedrin. What is that? The Sanhedrin, they are the Pharisees and the elders of the law. 
And scripture says, I think, in, I believe in verse 12, that they took notice of what being with Jesus had done to them. They know that they were ignorant and unlearned men, but they took notice that being with Jesus had changed them. Listen, he had made them to be like Christ. Why? Because they had submitted themselves to discipleship, to proper tutor. It is difficult for you to be like Christ without you being taught to be like him. Therefore, there are discipleship classes that make people to become, to be a semblance of Jesus. And that's very important. That's very important. We live in a world where the people want to be like certain heroes. But it's time to be like Christ. That's the ultimate call of God for every one of us, to be like Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Pierre, this question, I don't even know how to phrase it. Somehow. Okay, but it's one we, we got from. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, the question is, how can I woo a Christian sister, even if I am not as spiritual as she is, and will she say yes? What? <laughs> I cannot answer that question. Because I am not the Christian sister. But if you know that a Christian sister is more spiritual than you, then you cannot go and preach spirituality to her. It's about a journey in life, a helpmate. So how can you know a helper suitable for you? That's scriptures. Without first of all knowing where you are going. So a man does not have a project. He doesn't have where he's going. He's looking for an helper suitable. Now that's very wrong. How am I supposed to help you? What are you doing that I'm helping you for? So that it is not that... Now, why did I say that? It's because we are not on all, we are not all on the same spiritual ground. And let me say this. A man will not necessarily marry a woman that is less spiritual than him. There are times and seasons that God will send you to people who are more spiritual than you. But it is wrong for you to stay there. So at the point where God is telling you that's your wife, she's more spiritual than you, accept it. But then she has to be a race for you because you must meet her and you must overlap her. Because you can't be a priest in your house. You can't be a true husband. You can't be a ruler. You can't be the one who stands on the wall and knows what is going in, what is coming out. If your wife is the one telling you, <laughs> I had a vision. I have a dream. God said to me, and he said, ah, which direction is this God always taking? So that you grow. But having said all of that, listen, how do you woo a woman? If that is the question. You woo a woman by being a semblance of Jesus. <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> <laughs> To know any sister in the world. You'll be a semblance of Jesus. Scripture says, my word that we grace is in with salt. And we do. Your words must be sweet. <laughs> Great. That's how to be a semblance of Jesus. Being a semblance of Jesus means you have to smell well. You have to dress good. Jesus died. They had to be doing some things concerning his clothes. If the clothes was not good, they would not be doing that. If it is one cloth you have, take care of it. You should not come close and you are speaking and I'm saying hallelujah. Do you know there are some people when they start speaking, you don't want to say anything again. <laughs> because as they are oozing, hmm. it's terrible. How much does it take to buy a deodorant? One, two, sir. <laughs> One, two. Many of us don't even know that as, as guys, I'm telling you how to, now you ask the question. Many of us don't know as a guy that you are supposed to you, you may not shave your birds, but you are supposed to shave your armpits. You are supposed to. There's no supposed to be a forest there. No matter the one, two you use, even you use ten, five. If the thing is heavy, you sweat, it will smell. So that the aroma you are carrying is the aroma of the world, not the aroma of Jesus. Are you following what I'm saying? A semblance of Christ. Look like him. I don't want to be confused when I see a man. Is he using mouse? Is he using birds? Or is he just confused? Everything looking scraggy. If you are doing shape, if you are cutting it, shave it up, look like a egg. If you are not looking like a egg, I mean, let it be a cut. Yeah, let it be fresh. Let it be fresh. Know how to combine clothes. You, am I speaking your mind, man? <laughs> know how to combine clothes. 
You cannot wear purple shirt and then your trouser is pink. What is wrong with you? Something is wrong. Has it? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So you don't just look at your wardrobe and just carry anything you like. There is a standard. Jesus is that standard. Are you following what I'm saying? That, that, that's it. So be a semblance of Christ. It's very, see, these things are simple. Praise the Lord. Very a round simple. of applause. Of Hallelujah. All right. So we have from the audience. Sometimes I feel overwhelmed by life, marriage, children, etc. I feel I haven't achieved anything personally. What can I do to help my situation? Find purpose, find life. Find purpose, find life. Listen to this. Your time will never be enough. Um, life will always happen to us. But in as much as you are on the journey of purpose, it gives you a satisfaction that nothing else in this world can give you. So you must find purpose. And purpose is living for something that is higher and bigger than us. Just what I'm trying to say. So I remember I was talking to a lady and she believed that her purpose is helping people. Is helping people. And sometimes if she gives somebody 2,000 naira, she's happy because she's able to help that person. Now you have given 2,000, you didn't feel any happiness. That's not your purpose. In fact, you feel very sad. You feel cheated. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Because it's not you. Find your purpose. Purpose is not an accumulation of wealth or being able to count things. You see, purpose will also ensure that you don't compare yourself with other people. The reason many of us are sad is that comparison race. Is that race of we don't have a car yet. Um, the job is not paying me eight figures. You know, she's somebody did a testimony of six figures. Soon she will start saying seven figures. And so the competition never ends. So what gives you satisfaction cannot be money. It has to be purpose. Jesus said, I have, no, it wasn't Jesus, it was said concerning him 14, 47 of the book of Psalms and 10, 7 of the book of Hebrews. He said, I have come as is written of me in the volume of the book to do your will, O God. There's a will for every life. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. The will of the Father for your life is that you fulfill purpose. To fulfill purpose. And you must find that purpose. And it is in God. It's in God. Some people's purpose is writing. So it's not something difficult. I, I tell people God will be a bad God to hide it from you. Then shall you know if you follow to know the Lord. 10, 12 of the book of Isaiah. You must follow to know. If you follow to know it, you'll find it. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Praise God. Any other question from the audience? Okay. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, my name is Tony. Um, I'm really impressed um, with the whole conversation. And, you know, based on the, the uh, what do you call it, the uh, conversation, some questions you know, arising. I think I have like, maybe one or two three that I want to ask. Now, um, is a marriage not supposed to be a blessing? Is marriage supposed to be a blessing? Is it not supposed to be a blessing? It is. Okay. So why is it that when, uh, uh, what do you call it, a couple comes together and say, oh, I was led by God, you know, that um, we, should, we should come to form a union. Then after two, three years, those people that are, that are together, they become eaters of each other. Hmm. All right. Baseline. Baseline. Um, baseline is that there are two institutions that I've always said that are created by God. And those are the two institutions that the devil loves to attack so much. The first one is the institution of marriage. The second institution is the institution of the church. Therefore, you find in these two places, um, Old Testament, the, um, Old Testament, you find the marriage and then the New Testament, the church. And then you find that the devil has attacked these two things more than anything in the world. Now, let me say this to you. God said two persons should get married. I mean, love each other. They felt they are led of God. They confess love for each other and the priest joined them together. But don't forget that it wasn't God that will stay with them in that marriage. They are going to have to deal with two persons. A man and a woman. And both of them must have certain things in place. Um, that's why I tell people that getting married is not something you just do like you wake up. 
and say, I want to go and pick up a car. You must be prepared for marriage. And preparation for marriage, it's more of knowledge preparation than physical preparation. It's not now that you have shapes. No, that's not it. It has to do with knowledge. How prepared are you for a home? Now, the first knowledge in marriage is the knowledge of experience, which is if you actually are coming from a good home where your parents are staying together, you have a privilege that nobody else has. See, I, I don't know whether we tell ourselves this enough in church, but if your parents stay together, and uh, you may not like the fact that you have never seen them kiss, to be, kiss each other. Forget all those ones kissing on Instagram. After two months, they are off. But for them to have you, you prove that they had sex. Amen. So, <laughs> I mean, you are an example. So, if you have a marriage, a people, a family that are married, you have something that is very good. That experience cannot be bought. I mean, I'll tell you that that's the lack many people have. Now, if you don't have that, I always show, I remember there are people I sent to my father's house when, when I was in Lorraine. I sent them there to go and stay there for two weeks. And why was that? Because I know that my parents' marriage was very beautiful. And they had, it's very beautiful. It's yes. very beautiful. It's very beautiful. And uh, I know that for them to actually have, to clean that experience they had from their home, because their head was tweak. The way they are saying, I can't take any rubbish from a girl. Oh. I can't, because your dad did not take any rubbish. Do you understand? What you call rubbish is even love. Do you understand? I, I can't. So I, I had to tell them, oh, yeah, go home. So I, I called my parents. They will be staying for two weeks. They didn't know why they were staying, but I just needed them to detox. And so when they saw them pray together, saw them go out together, they begin to ask questions. Yeah, is marriage like this? Is this how it's supposed to be? So, number one, if you don't have that experience, you might have to have a picture, an image of somebody that you know that is not pretense and this is real. That's number one. Number two, prepare by reading books. There's so much information in books that if you will read them, it will prepare you for a journey. The reason I don't do so much of relationship seminars or teaching relationship, I, I teach it a lot, I'll still get there, I'll still teach it, is the fact that people just laugh off the, the message many times. <laughs> and then they are jumping on it. But the message, and then you will hear people say, Tell them, tell them. Meanwhile, they are photo. Tell them. <laughs> and, and because they feel you are preaching to others, not to them. Now, number three is the fact that certain things were already going to wreck before people got married. Because what you are looking for, when I see some people bring their wives, I say, ah, I know this is wife, but when they see, I see some, I say, ah, I pray for them, so they need I pray more. <laughs> because I know that that marriage will only be sustained on the pray on the power of prayer. But when some people come, I say, ah, So when they were talking, it's like I'm doing confession prayer. Thank you, Father. It's done. Glory to God. And I just give them to what they have to do. But there are people that I know that, hey, hey, you will pray, oh. You will, Adurake, oh. <laughs> you see, you have to, you know, Adurake is actually, you have to go to Kogi to find, because they are praying, when you see praying in tongues, and um, it's what they are going from at all. My wife used to say, she, you know, she, she used to work in operations in the bank. And some of their bosses don't want to go home. So instead of them to come and sign off, so that people can finish their work, they will not come. Because home is not sweet. So you are wanting to go home, they are saying, what is at home? They are waiting for like eight so that they can meet them boys. And then they will go home around ten. And some guy's lifestyle cannot take marriage. I'm telling you reasons why marriage fell. Some of them. Some of you, you cannot get married yet. I'm sorry. But your lifestyle cannot. You want to go out with them boys, come back 11 p.m. You don't sit at home. You don't stay at home. Then who marry them boys now? You just want to be drinking around and enjoying life. And you're not thinking about the other party. Now, if that girl now goes out and go and come back, you, you, have you discovered that guys who, the most jealous guys are the ones who don't take what they can give. I mean, 
they hug everybody. Yes. They are at parties. They, they are, are clubs. Great. But the moment the lady does the same, eh, see what you are wearing. Look at what you also wore. Like you are going to gym. <laughs> you see, and so I believe that what you, when you find a man, you want to get married now. The guy you want to marry, he locks his hair like this. He has, he has, he has weaved his hair. And then he parted this way and put parts in there. And then, you see my rings, there are two. His own is four. Do you see that? Do you get what I'm saying? And then his chain is here. And then, oh, what's in the beanie? Now, it's a different thing if he's an entertainer. Now, if you want to marry an entertainer, ask yourself, can I marry an entertainer? Because you are marrying everybody's girlfriend. That, I just think you should know that. Now, his only weakness is sex. His only weakness is sex. Tieti, bye. I'm telling you, his only weakness is shape. His only weakness is shape. Will all the shaped girls leave the world? They're always going to be there. Self-control, important. Forgiveness, important. You can remember the clothes your girlfriend wore when she spoke to you three weeks ago. The way she spoke to you. And sometimes when you are sleeping and you remember, you start sweating. You cannot marry yet. You have issues with forgiveness. Unforgiveness, sorry. You have issues with that? Because you see, marriage... When you see somebody married for 50 years, that is 50 years of unceasing forgiveness. It is not 50 years of love. It is 50 years of unending forgiveness. Not that the person did it was when they forgave. They forgiven before they got married. But we live in a time where we compare ourselves with others. We live in a time where people don't forgive. We live in a time where divorce is just thrown outside. I remember the advice my dad gave me. Are you sure you want to marry I said, yes, did they give you that certificate? You also tear it. That's why you sign it. Are you ready or not? Divorce is not an option. I tell people when I was dating, if my wife had said it that if it does not work, we are going to divorce, I was going to just break it up immediately there. Because if divorce is an option to you, then you will not work it out. Marriage works because people work it out. Just the same way your business is working because you are working it out. Marriage is hard work. You must work it out. But if you are saying, I'll just try my best and I'll leave. And let me say this to all our sisters. I love you with the love of God. But there's something that happens to you when you're in your 40s and 50s. It's called boredom. See all these feminized and all of those things. That's why they, you discover that sometimes they just become baby mama. So that they have, a, they have somebody they are staying with that can at least keep their company. God knows that you are going to be bored and lonely in the journey of life. That's why he gave you an help myth. Find an help myth. Find life. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay. Another question about that marriage. Because he says something about uh, giving purpose. Some people, when they get married, marriage helps them realize they are giving purpose. Okay, now for the female Alex side. cannot help you realize purpose. So you should realize purpose before you get married. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, what if, um, like I still say, I'm still talking about scripture now. We are we are led by God, you know. Mm -hmm. So now maybe like after five years, you now probably realize that oh, there's this stuff I want to do. Like I want to do this stuff, and I know that I will find passion yeah. and I will make money and all of that. And it's not affecting the marriage, you know. Like income, I want to be a boss lady, you know. So how do you how do you how do you marry? How do you blend that? Ah, I, I don't I don't I don't know. I don't like boss ladies. I don't like people who have ambition to be boss men or boss ladies. So it's not even just boss lady. And I don't think that finance should run our life. I believe love should run our lives. Either love for our children, love for God, or love for our family. I believe love should run our life. Even if you are doing business, it should be the love you have for solving a problem. Love for solving a problem. That should be what runs our life. Now, people come up with many things. And I also want to speak to the men. Because just the same way she had that vision, you also will have a vision five years from now and say, this one will give me money. And you go there. But when a lady decides she's going to do that, we always have an issue with that. Some people say I'm close to being a feminist as a pastor. But truth is, when we were all growing up, if you remember, there was no sex. You said you want to be a pilot. A lady also said she want to be an engineer. And everybody talked about her vision that way. But suddenly they got married. And then you start telling them that they have to submit their own vision. Why it's alright for you to run your own vision. I think it's unfair. 
But I also think that nothing should affect our home. We should always put our marriage in front, whether the man or the woman. We should always put our marriage in front. And everything should be done in agreement. Even if you feel that a lady should not do something because it's going to affect the business, there's a way to convince her. And there's also a way to put the systems in place that it does not affect the business. I was speaking with somebody uh, recently and she said she had to resign her work and she was paid in high figures. She had to resign her work uh, because of her family. He said she got, she, she was at GT Bank. Uh, sorry, I didn't want to mention that. She was at, she was at her workspace. 1 a.m. one day. And she told herself, I can't continue this way. She, I, I mean, she said her husband had been saying it, but he was not pushing. He said, but that day, one year, she told herself, this is not life. And she resigned. Now, she, when, when she was telling me, the husband was looking at her and she was, he was, doing, he was smiling. He said, you know, I'm glad I didn't push her. Because she had to come to that conclusion by herself. At certain times, we should also realize that our wives or ladies also are thinking. And so, we should pray and not push. There are things you should push. But there are things you should just let them come to that reality so that they don't say you are the one who don't allow them to fly. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? So, uh, But I feel there is a balance. A balance of I'm putting my marriage in front. I'm putting my life and my family in front. And that should always be in front. God, family, should always be in front. Because when anything happens to you at the workplace, it's family that will be there. Do you understand? I don't put I don't put ministry. I don't put you guys. I love you guys before my family. Hallelujah. I won't do that. Because I've been sick now unto death before. You know now. Only a few people were there. The church continued. Praise God. The, the way they did praise and worship the Sunday that followed was the exact way they would have done it if I had died. And I accept it. Listen to this. If I die, Ransom now should call Sinachi. They can afford it and have a good place because I'm in God. So no it's sadness. God. I'm just trying to say to you that I have no issue with that. I just have an issue with you not understanding what priorities are. Yes, Family is our priority and it should remain that. A round of applause for that, please. Yeah, my last question. Um, I actually realized that. <laughs> <laughs> when, when um, uh, what do you call it when um, Pan and Numa come together and they are usually married yeah. they have time for each other to do all the loving and all of that but when they have the first child the love the wife has for the husband will reduce because all attention is now focused on the, on the on the child and that also you know so I don't know how you can you know balance that so thank you alright so um, I, I like to give practical example I remember when we got married we said we were ready to be or I, I was ready to be a husband but I wasn't ready to be a father there are two different things there are stages in life and she was not also ready to be a mother because you see many times we cannot we don't do well we responding to faces in life life are in face life is in faces things will change let me say this to you children change your home the way nothing else will ever do if you are not ready, <laughs> so that if you are a jealous person and say, I have my wife completely, I have my wife completely, I have my wife completely, Oga, that baby came out from a womb and babies will drink, they will drink breast milk, they will cry, they will shout, and she does not have more than herself to give. Even when you say, I give myself away, listen, she's going to give herself to that child and she's not going to try for you. She's going to try. It's not that she want to abandon you. It is now you that will now try as much as possible to understand that she started half of the time. So dress out. She want to dress out. She, she doesn't even have time to dress out. Because the baby did not allow her to sleep. So I, I tell folks that when you get married, if possible, and they are not doing you, so that you are not thinking maybe there's nobody that has given back to your family. If possible, don't you don't get pregnant on the night of your wedding. I know many pastors don't agree to this, but see, we live busy lives. We, the way we, we are not dating the way our fathers were dating. When our fathers were dating, they were in the same town. They were seeing each other practically every day. They were seeing each other. They were into each other. You were barely saying, I know people who are dating in this same Lagos, and they don't see each other in a month. 
and they are dating in the same Lagos. Work will not allow. So now that you are going to be living together in the same house, if you she get pregnant on the wedding night, she is coming to your house not as the girl you dated, but as a pregnant woman. And let me say this to you: if she has money sickness, you are going to care for that. So you will never even know your wife. Because when children come, they change. And there's nothing you can do about that. And let me say this to you: children don't go. <laughs> it takes 25 years of your life. I'm counting down. I think they has only about 16 years to go. <laughs> I'm waiting for them. They should just find their way and be going to where they want to go to. Do you understand what I'm saying? But they will change your life. 20 years they will take it. We'll go on shopping. I, I mean, I gave her money. We went together. And then I saw the shopping list. Oh my God, and they will print it at blank. It will be long. Two pages. And then I saw that they took one and a half. So that tells you that they are going to take your finance. They suck it. I'm telling you. They suck it. So if you are not ready, I tell folks, this is not, if it is one year you want to do, the parents ask you, say they should be praying. That's why I told them. They will be praying. Allah and Sheikh, be praying. Just now they will hear now. They have said this. Thing. But just tell them. Because things change. So, so that you are now very used to her. You, are, you now know how she responds to the situation. You don't marry a woman who is nagging because she's pregnant. It's not her fault. It's her first pregnancy. She doesn't understand what's going on in her belly. If God now gave you twins, you are in trouble for life. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you, you have to understand these things. There are twins in this house, so they know who they are. Uh, God, I beg. So <laughs> I'm telling you that things, so things can change your life. That's what I'm trying to say. But you can always plan your life. Praise God. Yeah. Um, so think that the mindset is very important. Now your statement that the statement that the wife will just transfer the love she has for the husband to the child. So I want to ask, what's happening to the man's love at that point in time? It should pour his love on both of them. Do you understand what I'm saying? It should not be that the man should now suddenly see that oh, she has moved to the baby. The baby belongs to both of them. As she's washing, okay, we don't wash diapers. As she's doing this, you two do this. At the end of the day, you are equally tired. You are even, it, so it you builds, are not anybody it, anybody. it builds closeness between them when they take the baby as a joint responsibility. The man should not stand back and be jealous of his baby. He should be involved also. Thank you. By the way, I am very involved. <laughs> A round of applause for PFA. <laughs> okay. Someone should uh, please give to us the mic. Oh, ah, sorry. <laughs> PFA, I have this. So, as a child born into a Christian home, you already know God the way your parents know God because it's what they teach you that you grow up with. So, God is my savior. God is God is that. But then, as you grow up, some of us that are fortunate, you now experience God for you. And then you realize that it's not as shallow as they've made it look like. There is a depth to it. And then you are interested in finding that depth. But then there's a life you've been living before. There's a way you've been doing things before. There are people that are in your life. And then when you now find God in a different way, you now realize that, okay, these people are not really helping me in this new path. And then you are caught between, should I... I, I don't know, should I start living a different life? Should I continue or should I just be able to manage it? And after a while, maybe because you are not yet, you don't have a solid footing in this new dimension. You just waylays, like just drift back to your routine. And then something happens again, have another experience and you're like, okay, I want to know this God. I want to press for that. I want to do this. And then life comes again and just dribbles you. So I, I want to ask that. At the point where you are trying to discover God for yourself, how do you keep that consistency? Uh, how do you, I don't want to use the word, but how do you keep the fire burning so that life doesn't just throw you off your feet? Because it's not as if you are deviating from the way of God. It's not, but there's a different, I don't know how to explain it. Okay, let me use don't practical. Worry, don't worry. Okay. Because we use two hours to ask this question. I have to use four hours to answer it. 
Praise God. All Amen. right. I, I also would like to say that every generation, God becomes deeper in every generation. The knowledge of God becomes deeper in every generation. So that when we talk about our parents and their knowledge of God, we can say, oh, it seems very shallow. But for their own parents, <laughs> what they knew was revelation. So wait, in 30 years, your child will look at you and say, the God you are serving, you don't know him. Because now they are also into deeper. All right, so we are always going to go into deeper. So I said that so that you don't look at them like um, they are less or something. Because we have that thing in this generation to just look down on other people and say, those denominational folks don't really know much. We get, they do. And they find answers. They don't speak in tongues. But Charles Pogio never spoke in tongues. Can I continue? Yes. Uh -huh. There are a lot of people you read their books now that never spoke in tongues. Andrew Murray never spoke in tongues. You, you won't believe that. They only just were praying and they spent hours in prayers but they never seen Makalabadoshi. How What were they saying? If I want to live in their days, I know how they did that. But that just tells you that there are dimensions in this God. Understand that? There are dimensions in this God. And so the new dimension you have found and how do I keep that fire burning? Number one, what the company you keep. Because you'll still start smelling like the company that you keep. Uh, you'll find a company of fire people. David said, I, we took sweet cancer together and went to the house of the Lord in comp. Now know. keep yourself from distraction. The devil understands that he can't keep the fire from you. The only thing he can do is to distract you. So if he can distract you, he will take the fire away. So you must guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it flows the issues that governs life. Are there ways that you can, even if you don't expressly go for what you want, are there ways that you can impliedly go for what you want and it will be okay? Then my second question is concerning businesses. I don't know if there are businesses that Christians are not allowed to run. Okay, maybe we're, maybe we're not allowed to do stuff like maybe selling cigarettes. And stuff. But like, is he allowed to maybe have a lounge? Obviously, in your lounge, alcohol served. Even if it's not dry gin, I mean cocktails. Cocktails contain some level of alcohol, depending on whatever it is you're drinking. So is that fine to to own a lounge, a not a bar, right? I know, I know a lounge. Okay, so you know lounges can be restaurants in the daytime, and then towards the evening, in the cool of the day, they serve like maybe just fries and you know cocktails. Is that good? Is that fine. So now we're talking about, uh, I think the second question has to do with Christian ethics. Um, what is ethical for a Christian, a believer in business? I, I've always maintained that what runs businesses is making money. Do you agree with that? Yes, businesses sir. are run to make money. But that's the reverse for the believer. You can't run business, you can't do business just for money making purposes. If that's the case, I've told my wife countless times. I would have a betting office everywhere in Nigeria and I'll be paying all of you to come to church because I'll be sticking here with you. You want to make money, just do betting. I'll be betting. They bet money, bet their money away and then buy. I mean, you can buy malt. 200 naira outside or 500 and then in the bar or in a lounge, you get it for 1,500 and they put eyes on it. So it, it's like, a cucumber, I'm thinking. <laughs> There's a lot of money here, babe. So if it's about making money, it's truly, those are business ideas that are very cool. But then you need to begin to ask yourself ethics. What is the impact of what I am selling to the health of people, to the lives of people, to the marriage of people, to the homes of people? Why is that important? Because we cannot join in destroying the world that God is trying to repair. That's what ethics says. I cannot join in destroying the world that the world that God is repairing. I can't be the light and also be in the darkness in certain places. Just what I'm trying to say. So that's ethics. And when we talk about ethics, then it talks about morality. And there seems to be no right or wrong. Because if we stretch that argument so far, then people begin to say, it means I cannot walk in a beer production company. And then, so that's why I say, you're going to stretch it. And then you get out of Nigeria. I remember while I was in a class, 
uh, a quote, um, and there were a lot of people from Australia, Canada, and all of that. And they were saying that, oh, we can't wait for us to meet together. And someone said, there's a bar in front of the school, not too far. We can just have a swear time. I mean, I was in that class with the Ghanaian. The Ghanaian chatted me and said, am I the only one feeling wrong that they are talking about bars? <laughs> I said, no, we are in good company. I'm also not feeling okay with that. But they feel very fine because they drink. And they are pastors. And they drink. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine and said there was a break. They went for a better, I think, a conference, don't let me mention them, in South Africa. And then they said, oh, let's just go lounge. And everybody was serving beer. And he said he just cacked up with his Ghanaian friend. I mean, it's always Ghanaian and Nigerian. I just sat down with them. I was thinking, is there something wrong? And then they said, and then the next day they said, we had such a great time yesterday. It was such a great time. And what are you looking like? Because for them, so when we talk about ethics and morality, culture matters. People also matters. And somebody say it does not matter. I can I can I can braid my hair. The question I ask them is, will it be okay for me to braid my hair and be your pastor? So because we want to get to some questions. If it's okay, then I can also come to church. I might braid it because I have hair, very good one. And then you people must also come to church and not be angry that I, I I'm coming. So so that we so that it now becomes your moral compass my moral compass therefore is the holy spirit inside of me some things might be fine for you but they are not fine for me do you understand i might not judge you but it's not fine for me but i think there are no no for believers i think there are no no for believers uh believers should not have lounge that are that are for pimping you know there are pimping you know that ah, ah, one bomb on me and then they, they are destroying lives of and you know that married people come with their rings and, and you are fine and you come to church and come alone Sunday I worship you my king the Holy Spirit is not telling you anything he's not telling you anything these are so so I, I think it's also according to our work with God the deeper you get to Jesus the more holy you want to be the closer you are to him the more certain things are profane to you you don't just don't just like it therefore I tell people that if I make it my standard your standard then it's like I want to kill all of you you get what I'm saying? But you have the Holy Spirit. There's a moral compass. And there's a word compass. There's the scripture compass. Ask yourself, am I an image of a God? Or am I an image of Christ? The next time you dress. <laughs> she knows the eyes. Don't worry. There's a conversation that has gone on before now. So. Ask yourself, who am I representing? Have I make, let me say this to you, making money is good as a believer. It's important. In fact, it is core. But we cannot make business ideas only for making money. Therefore, they call you and say, we have certain things we want to dump. And say, let's go and drop it in the river. And it's going to cause the death of people. Because you know that they are going to take from that water. Now, a non-believer does not, in as much as he's taking his dollars, he's cashing out. You can't do that. Because you know that it's going to kill people. Yeah. That's, that's, that's Christianity. That's the Christian faith. It's, it's not that we can say everything is not stated in scriptures. That's why Jesus said, there are many things I want to say to you, but I cannot say, but I'm giving you the helper, the Holy Spirit. So if your conscience judges you concerning anything, then you should know that something is wrong there. Praise the Lord. Praise Amen. the Lord. Yes. Yes. Questions. Yeah. yes. The second question is, can I... No, no, I, I'm not talking. I don't think she's particular about shooting shots. <laughs> I think she's 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 saying that no, so she's not gonna she's not asking that I will shoot, but I know this is my shot. So, but she's not she's saying, Can I have a shot and can I go for my shots? To go for my shots. That's what she's oh, saying. that's shooting your shot. Yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crushing. That's crushing. Yeah. All right. So it's it fine. I think. I think. I think. I think. Cultures also matter. I think I, I was told that in Ghana, ladies can shoot their shots. I was told in India that ladies can shoot their shots. So culture matter, and there is no Christianity without culture. I mean, I can teach you that Jesus and culture. In Nigeria, I'm not sure I found any culture where you can shoot your shots. 
Now, I'm not also talking about culture. Let's talk about spiritually and the man himself. I've dealt with many men in Nigeria. And I'll tell you that when you shoot your shot, they don't value you so much. Do you have agreement here? Tosi, raise your hand with your chest. <laughs> All right, so I don't want to be in that two way as a lady. I don't want to be inferred in their heart or in their mind that I am cheap. Now, there's something every guy agrees with. That guys like to fight for something and they value something they chase. They value something they look forward to. It's not every guy. Can I ask a question? No. Can I ask you a question? Any guy here who wants to marry... Let's take this conversation with Sayadini, right? So let's make it conversational, right? Okay. If you... If, will you marry a lady and be sincere right now because we want to do a poll. Be sincere right now. You have the Holy Spirit. Will you marry a lady that shot, I shot at you? Uh, what I just want to say is shooting your shot doesn't necessarily mean you are cheap here. Yeah. I like you. A girl can tell me they like me. But then, she raised her standard. She has made it known that she likes me. Yeah. And she made everything like yeah. you. Yeah. She has raised her standards. Yeah. So, regardless of how much you are short or the way they are putting me, doesn't make her cheap. It's the way she goes about it that makes her. Just make it know that I like you. Can I, I'm open thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's let's balance this out. Let's balance this out according to scriptures. 1440, 1 Corinthians. The Bible says, let all things be done decently and in order. I'm not sure that any one of us can get home and tell our parents that you get shot shot at me. You know? even though you know it in your heart. But I will say this, that don't ever be desperate for any guy. That is very wrong. Don't ever be desperate for any guy. But there is a way without shooting my shot that I know that if I ask this girl out, she's going to tell me yes. Because she has almost, I know she likes me. She's not pretending. She has implied it. Uh, so I, I know that if I pray, uh, if I pray and I'm convinced that she's the one, I'm, I'm almost sure that if I ask her out, she's going to tell me yes. That is different from me going to all the Instagram posts and almost at the point of stalking. Liking all of the posts. Even if the guy likes it. Because even guys have come to a point now that they are becoming like, they are not so hard anymore. So they are saying, oh, oh like, oh, for, that's okay. So he's liking the attention. But liking the attention is not the same as valuing the person. Because again, the guy can also now become a little bit afraid and say, why is this girl this desperate? You don't want them to put desperate in front of your name. You don't want them to feel like, ah, maybe she's getting hold. That's why. And don't forget that there are always oddities. That means that if a guy says, I don't mind, like Alan says he does not mind, but well, Alan's going to marry somebody that Alan asks out. See, I say, I tell you. <laughs> I say, I tell you. But if they say they don't mind, it's because also, we also love attention. But you shooting your shots. Now, let me say this to you. And this will be my answer. You shooting your shots, you doing all that you do, will not make a guy ask you out if the guy does not value you and love you enough. So I would rather not risk my self-integrity for that. If he, he loves you, I don't care the barrier. If he loves and value you, he will come for you. He will come for you. That's the way I see it. If he loves you enough, he will come for you. Ah, ah. No, do you know that song? No mountain he will not pull down. If he actually loves you. So I'm not saying you may not shoot your shots, but you are talking about marriage here. You are not talking about a fling. They are not talking about you. They are talking about a lifetime commitment. What will keep a guy for life 
is actually true love that is based on his conviction. A true love because it's a journey, oh, Baba. When that beauty goes, that shape, because look at my wife. <laughs> In fact, the tie has come out well, beautiful. She's become more gracious. Oh. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> See, but wait. What if she got, what if I got married to her and she blew? You know what they call blue? Barova. Balloon. <laughs> now, if she blew in shape, what do you think will take me, will keep me at home? It is my conviction. But if she was the one that had pulled herself on me, man, So it, it, I'm trying to say that if a guy, guys are go-getters. When they value something, they go for it. That's why some guys will tell you, they are not your boys, but will tell you they will never drive your Toyota. It's Benz they are looking for. It's Benz they will drive. Because they are like that. It is what drives them. And I'll tell you this, according to scriptures, wives are the most important price in the life of a man. Check the story of Aserus, the king, in the book of um, Esther. The Bible says, after he had displayed all of his splendor in all of the world, he said, now it's time for Vashti, the most beautiful woman to come out. Because for him, that's the girl. That's the babe. And the woman refused to come out. They dethroned her. They dethroned That tells you that he valued the woman. He knows that no beauty ray. Let me say this to you. If you are not moved by her beauty, if you are not moved by her brain, if you are not moved by her value, if you don't have self-conviction, marriage of 40 years will be difficult to stay on because she shot her shot at you. I will tell you as a lady, preserve yourself. Let me say why I'm telling you that. They have shot shot at me. Not once, not twice. Before I got married, shot shot at me. <laughs> and I, I tell you that the attention was good. And I also did not want to hurt them. If you're a good guy, you don't want to hurt people who shoot their shot at you. And, and many of the people who are saying it's okay, it's because they're also very nice at heart. Very calm people. So they, I don't want to hurt you. So they will give you attention. They will, I will stay, I will try to tell you, people, they walk over. <laughs> but if, no, it's not like people like this one. You can slap them. Get out. <laughs> we are not talking about you. <laughs> you understand? So, but eventually, I left. And I took my way. I, I left them. Now, I don't regard them so much. Not because I don't want to. Why would you shoot shot at me now? Let me decide that your value. It's a choice I make. Fine boy, Nisa. And, and, and that's what I think. I, I, I think that we should stay with scriptures and we should understand that, listen, marriage is a journey. Shoot your shot at a boyfriend and girlfriend. But I don't believe any church member should be doing that. Shoot your shot. But there is a way you can position yourself. I preached that message a long time ago. Positioning yourself for a life partner. The Bible speaks concerning a man that the man finds. The woman actually positions herself. What the world is calling shooting your shots. The best you can do is to position yourself. Is to position yourself. I, I, and I'll give you an example in scriptures. Ruth positioned herself for Boaz to see. Boaz was so dedicated to business, he yeah. would never have seen Ruth. If her marriage was not in Boaz's head. But when Ruth positioned herself, oh, was there, always there, always pay attention to the old man. In fact, the old man was speaking, ah, for you not choosing a young person. <laughs> he, was, he was mesmerized by the positioning. You can position yourself. Yes, so that when the man is thinking about marriage, because some guys are not thinking of marriage, actually. They are just friends with you. But the day they will start saying, it's time to settle down. Because you are positioning yourself there. You are in their way. You are in their radar. Ah! See, I, I cannot look too far. I can't look too far. This girl likes me. She's a lover of God. Let me just go and do genotype. Hey! Ah, I just talked to her. I said, Alpha, babe. And, I mean, I was just talking about my friend. And then, you no, know, you can't ask genotype straight. And then you lead to genotype. Say, hey, hey. <laughs> and then let me so, go and pray some more. And then you come. Because she has positioned herself. What we can do is to position ourselves. The wisdom of this world is not for us. Position yourself. So that he knows that. Uh, and you know, the guy already knows. That if he asks you out. In fact, that day, she might, he might get a yes. But you will not say yes. 
because we also want to do self preservation. So he said, I want to go and pray. She knows, he's not even afraid because he knows that you have always been in love. The way you talk, you are always into each other. He knows you have positioned yourself. So what you can do is positioning. Not uh, all this uh, chase. She comes here. Yeah. In fact, you are going to see her. You have dressed in that way. Half of your... Half of your... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Half of your... Uh, 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 is flowing a multitude of... Uh, yes, all of those things are there. Because you are going to see him. You, you are tightly clothed. So that he can see shape. When a guy is looking for a life partner, those things don't really matter. Yes, sir. When he's looking for who to sleep with, they matter. They matter. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. The Lord keep us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, let's Hel- ask to ask your question. Hel- Hello. Uh, Pr- praise God. Hold on. Hold on. We, we've actually exhausted our time. If, yes, we've really exhausted our time. So what we can do is, if you have personal questions, you can ask, ask PFA after the service or wait till the next conversation. Uh, we'll just take one more. Pastor, I will time you. Five seconds. Pastor, five minutes, please. And we're done. All right. Yes, to answer the question. Two minutes. All right. I mean, you actually answered the question from kind of way during the question. So it's about you mentioning culture in the bible and oh yeah and i realized personal thing that i've been thinking in my head the kind of person you are if you have to write a bible now probably i know god will inspire you but your kind of person too will also show in the way you write your bible the way we take what we write a scripture in the bible is different from the way maybe or you will write it yeah, it just shows that um our kind of person can really influence the writing of the bible so probably all the prophets and the bible priests that wrote the Bible have their personal whatever in the Bible. I, I might be led by the Holy Spirit, but their personal interest also showed in the Bible. Yeah, and also the culture also. The culture where they practice this then is different from what we have in Nigeria. Yeah. And sometimes when you are reading the Bible, some of those things might actually be contradicting why you are reading it because you feel like um it might just be the morals of that person talking not probably it being a sin yeah it might just be because for example if pastor Sarah writes a bible verse now there's something that is going to put there that mean i know that i don't necessarily mean it's a sin but because pastor Sarah is like this he's going to say you should not do it not because it's a sin so i think sometimes so that's it <laughs> so that's what my question is how do you balance really like the culture and everything the individual and whole why reading the bible and do so really that's just my question can you can make some clarity on how to now, now let's 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 not use scriptures as example the bible says holy men of god wrote as they were inspired of the holy ghost nobody wrote scriptures by their own ability scriptures was written because the holy spirit inspired them to read it uh to write it of course you will see the personalities in like you said for instance if you read the book of jeremiah uh you will find a prophet who was into what they were going through prophet who was full of emotions and therefore you will find him crying in lamentation in fact the book of lamentation was all about what he saw his people going through but all of these things were also used of god to allow us to see certain things and certain clues i would like to say uh that there are certain things that are that they are subjective but there are certain things that are in the book and they are very clear sex outside of marriage is in the book um, the whole world may find it very easy to do this thing. I know you people will not ask questions on that. Uh, all this cohabitation. I mean, nobody will ask me, is it okay to cohabitate? You know why? Because you know it in your heart that pastor will say no. And because you also know it's no. Uh, but we find science is very easy to say, but not to do. Um, so I'll tell you that there are certain things that are relative. For instance, the question she asked about about um, businesses and starting businesses in a kind of way, those ones might look subjective because they are ethics. Even um, theologians don't agree fully on certain ethics, uh, but certain ethics are clear. You can't you can't be you can't be shooting your shot to a married man. I don't think you even need the Holy Spirit to tell you don't have sense. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So it's uh, those things are clear. So when we talk about um, 
culture affects him. That's what we mean. We are not saying that you can change scriptures because of your culture. But we, can, we are saying that it helps us to understand the settings of scriptures and where that happened even very well. And that's, that's what I want to say. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Ask your question. By the power over, confide on me. <laughs> Can I can I say that I, I I love I love I love truth in church. So I'll give you a practical example. I had an issue with a daughter of mine was getting married. By that I don't mean that I have a daughter. Okay, that uh, but you get the gist. You get the gist, right? She was getting married, and I did the counseling. So I sent I I just said okay, send the picture. Of, the bridal uh, gown, let me see it. And then she sent it. And I started speaking in tongues. And I said, you can't do this. He said, no, it's beautiful. It's not that bad. I wore it. I said, no. He said, so I, I said, he said, I said, but why do you want to do this? He said, but it is awesome. Nothing is showing. You know, we are living in a generation that they believe that, I'll say it, that nipple is the only thing that should not show. Uh, if you are not supposed to be in church today, I'm sorry, but I've said it. Alright, so that every other thing is not bad. Who, who lied to us? Who did that to us? I don't know who did that to us, but that's a lie from the pit of hell. Some things are just your husband's property. They are not for public viewing. In fact, there are some movies that they put private viewing, private property. Uh, how do you make private property a public property? I don't understand. So she, she actually made it a, a public property on the wedding day. What the man is actually paying for and, and prostrating for. Alright, so the whole thing was, ah, it was very bad. It was very bad. Now, this was the conversation. He said, you can't wait. He said, no. I said, okay. So the only way I convinced her was, do you plan to have your wedding portraits in your house? He said, yes, we'll be on your house. <laughs> I said, I said, why? I said, so when I come, I just see rest everywhere. <laughs> he said, no, it's not like that. I said, but that's what you will look like. Because your portrait will be there. And then we, I said, now imagine your daughter or your son going and saying, look at mommy. Your mommy's skin is outside. I said, that. She said, oh, I will call my event planner. I mean, immediately she just changed that. Then we went conversation and she sent me another clue. She was going to, you know, they change clothes these days. And the street was like here. Yeah. I said, you know, Dana, I'll be teaching you what happened to you. Then she said she was not even the one that picked the wedding clothes and that clothes, but it was her husband. Because her husband just loved her to dress in provocative, sorry, I don't, they don't use the word provocative, in a sensual manner. And so now I understand that there are guys who want that. <laughs> And I, I, I don't want to say it, but I'll say it. We are canal brothers. Let her wear that short skirt. But let her wear it in the house. Because there is an image of a married woman. When people start seeing your wife dressed in a certain way, it is not your wife alone, it is also you. Because it's also talking about your image and the kind of person you have for allowing her to dress in that way. So that she wear skirt. I tell people, in as much as you are not a pastor, me now I cannot say my wife should wearing bomb shorts in the house because it is not our house. It's like a missionary house. There are all these people in the house. So even if I say she wear bomb shorts now, there are brothers that are not married downstairs. She don't be cursing wala for them. Do you understand what I'm saying? So she cannot. So if you have a private house, why not? But there are places you are going through. She's beside you. Have you seen Michelle Obama dress that way? 
You see, there are people we call power women. Those power women, they, they accept their entertainers. Even the entertainers, when they are dressing to certain events, they don't dress that way. If they are going for a bet award, they can do that. But if the president of US invites them, they don't dress that way. There, is a, there was recently an award that was given to somebody and the person dressed like people are abusing and accusing the person. You can say, you know where I walk people and say she's free to do what he's free to do whatever he wants to do, all of that. But the place you are going will determine what you dress. You dress for your journey. You dress for the kind of person you want to have. So can we just become a people that understand that our wife, tomorrow you can be the president or the governor. When they bring out pictures, will you now be explaining the pictures? Because Trump had to do it. When they bring out pictures of his wife, Melania, when she was a model, people had to bring out pictures and say, see the wife of our president. So you have to understand that there is a way you dress. And I'm not talking about not being beautiful. You can be covered and be very awesome. I've seen gowns, sir. If you have money, you can send it to me. I will buy. You don't have wife, so I'll buy it for my wife. You sit on her. <laughs> but I've seen gowns. See, correct that you will know that now this is godly, this is beautiful, this is awesome. You will see some gowns and say this is sexual. But you cannot say she opened anything. Are you following what I'm saying? So we can be dressed and we can be covered. And I think the guys, the men should not let the woman be like this. We are going to wreck a generation and wreck our lives that way. Because their children will dress worse. Yes, Are you following what I'm saying? So it's now so now an ethical issue for us. Thank you for listening. This has been The Living Word. If you have been blessed by this teaching or for counseling or any other inquiry, kindly send us an email to pfa at the ransomedhouse.com or Fisayo Adeniyi at yahoo.com or please call 0912-772-3824. The Ransomed House, empowering people to live for Jesus.